Divine Truth Theme Discussions Discussions between Jesus and Mary about specific topics and issues. This is session 12, part 2 of the discussion God's Laws of Forgiveness and Repentance, where Jesus and Mary continue to discuss God's principles and laws of forgiveness and repentance and the role of the human conscience, outlining how to use the conscience as a guide in our life, how the conscience builds sincere faith, and how the conscience encourages forgiveness and repentance. The session was recorded on the 20th of February 2018 from 11 a.m. in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. How to discern the difference between conscience and other factors? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question, isn't it? it because is. most people can't really tell the difference between a God influencing them via the conscience, their personal emotional feelings, and the personal emotional feelings of spirits who attempt to influence them. So, so the, there's all these sort of feelings coming at them, yeah, and thoughts coming at them. Yeah. And for the majority of people, they just believe them all to be their own. Yes. And, uh, and because of that belief, they frequently can't tell the difference between something coming from God, something coming from themselves, and something coming from external influences such as spirits that they can't see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It can be very confusing. Um, so in this section, we're going to talk about telling the difference between the conscience and spirit influence. And then later on, we'll talk about the difference between the conscience and our personal emotions, mm. um, because very often they use sort of interchangeably, aren't they, on they the planet are. today? Yeah, they so, are. Yeah. So we need to differentiate between them all. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Mm. <laughs> the difference between conscience and spirit influence. Now, this is a really important section, isn't it? Because we've established that the conscience is something coming from outside of us. Uh, but obviously there's other influences coming from outside of us, people we can't see who've passed already. And so how, how on earth are we going to tell the difference between? Yeah, so you could things? say that there's simultaneous communication coming mm -hmm. to the soul from a lot of different sources, actually. Um, and not, uh, not all the sources are physical in nature in the sense that we can see them. So, for, exa for example, there is communication coming to the soul via a person you can see, but they're not saying anything yeah. via their feelings. Yeah. So f frequently we can feel that, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, for many of us, we frequently feel that because of the way a person looks at us. Mm. Or the, the, you know, we, we then feel it. Does that make sense? Yeah. We, we read the physical signs and then we feel the emotion yeah. because the signs, you know, what we see in the demeanor of the individual yeah. reflects the emotion that we're now receiving from them. Mm -hmm. So now we can associate that that person must be projecting or feeling that feeling towards us because, uh, and, and their outward appearance validates the fact that yeah. they are projecting or feeling that feeling towards us. So in those circumstances, the majority of us have a very little problem actually determining what's coming at us. Yeah. When the outward demeanor of the individual reflects the feeling that we also feel. Yeah. And we use the outward demeanor to validate the feeling that yeah. we feel. The problem is that for the majority of us, it is when we can't see the person now, that could be because the person is removed from us by physical distance. Mm -hmm. In other words, they're still on earth, but they are removed from us and they're having feelings about us yeah. that are still coming at us that we can still feel. Yeah. But because we have no outward readable sign and the person's not in front of us to read the signs, the demeanor, mm -hmm. we then dismiss the feeling. Yeah because we, we don't know where it's coming from or we, we are not sensitive enough to understand how to feel who's feeling about us at any single point in time. And so we dismiss the feelings. Yeah. That also happens when we can't see them in, because they're in spirit. They're, they've now died and they're now in the spirit world. Yeah. Under those circumstances, those people have feelings for yes. us 
and frequently they can be right there in front of us. We can't see them, but they're right there and they're having these very strong feelings about us, whatever those feelings are. We feel the feelings, the feelings are coming at us and generally we're sensitive to feeling those particular feelings, but we don't validate them. We don't say, ah, oh, that's that feeling because we are not used to doing so without some external mm. visible sign that mm. a person is having a feeling. Yeah. And the same applies, you could say, with feelings that we receive from God yeah. or, or the thoughts that we receive from God via the, human, the conscious mechanism. These kind of thoughts come into our mind. Uh, we're not sure of their source in most cases. And so we don't see them as a, as a source outside of themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, frequently, we think them uh, as having a source inside of ourselves mm. if we think about it at all. Mm. So the real question then becomes, well, if, if this is what's happening to me all the time, how can I tell the difference between what's coming at me, if you could say, to me from God via mm -hmm. the conscience, mm -hmm. and how can I tell the difference between that and what's coming at me via spirit feelings, people's yeah. feelings that are just people that I cannot see? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So is it worth mentioning the fact that um, there's two different mechanisms at work here uh, one is a soul-based communication from god and the other is a spirit-based uh, spirit body-based communication or do spirits convey their feelings to our soul anyway i mean how does that all work well it depends on the development of the spirit in its method of communication mm -hmm. but but the reality is we are all feeling based individuals mm -hmm. so we are all able to feel if we're sensitive enough we can all feel what feelings other people have so so everybody including people we can see on earth have feelings about us yep everyone we know yep. has feelings about us and we are able to feel what those feelings are if we so choose mm -hmm. now those feelings do enter directly to our soul right. because that is feelings are a soul to soul direct communication. Mm -hmm. A lot of spirits are not aware that they are able to have feelings that are a direct soul to soul communication. Yep. Though. So the way that they usually uh, try to influence us is via thoughts. Yes. So, so they have a feeling which then is generated into one of their thoughts and they try to project the thought into our brain. And if our brain is open to receiving such a thought, which it will be based on our feelings and our addictions and our emotions, <laughs> mm -hmm. then we will receive such a thought and yeah. then potentially act upon that thought. So many of these spirits project information via both feelings and thoughts, mm -hmm. but they're not conscious necessarily that their feelings are able to be felt. Yep. And they feel more that their thoughts are the things that are responded to. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's very interesting talking to a spirit who has been used to transmitting thoughts. Yeah. Because when you tell him what his feelings are, yes, he, he goes, "Well, how'd you know that? How'd you know that is what I'm feeling?" Not being aware, of course, that every person is able to be sensitive to anybody's feelings. Yes. Um, and obviously, as we've been discussing about the conscience, we can't feel the conscience if we don't want to feel ourselves. So, but we can potentially receive thoughts from spirits and we can... Even if we don't want to feel even ourselves. Even if we don't want to feel ourselves. Yes. So that's also another place where confusion can happen, can't it? Because we can also receive thoughts from God, even if we don't want to feel ourselves. The conscious mechanism is it's possible to receive thoughts via it. Mm -hmm. and, and for the majority of people, the way it actually works is that we have certain resistances to certain kinds of thoughts yes. based on our emotions. Yes. And we have certain allowances of certain kinds of thoughts based on other emotions. And so that also then means that we have certain allowances of God's thoughts yes. when we have allowances to certain emotions. And where we're blocked, we don't have allowances to God's thoughts. Yes. So in the previous uh, section, you spoke about uh, in order to listen to the conscience, we need humility and the desire for truth. You're saying that in some areas, we're more humble than others and we desire truth more than others. Yeah. We might be very open to how to build a house, but very close to how to love our wife or something. Or yeah. vice versa. 
or vice versa. <laughs> You know, it, it, it depends a lot yeah. on our history, our experiences, our emotional injuries, our, yeah. you know, what, what our addictions are, what our demands are and what our desires are yeah. as to which parts we're open to and which parts we're closed to. Yeah, gotcha. Yep. Okay. All right. But, uh, yeah, okay, carry on. Well, I was Leave. thinking that before we probably answer the question of how to tell the difference between the conscience and the spirit influence, we probably just need to remind some people about spirit influence generally. Yes. Some ba just some basic things that we need to bear in mind. Mm -hmm. And the first thing we need to bear in mind is that not all influence is bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if a person's trying to influence us to be good, then it's a good thing to try to listen to them and, <laughs> and, and also potentially to act upon what, they, what you're hearing from them because they're trying to help you in your life, obviously. <laughs> yeah. so, so not all spirit influence is bad. There are many spirits who have a pure motive of helping you in your life. So I wouldn't suggest that everyone just goes, oh, any spirit influence, no, we're just going to cut that out of our life. That, that would be a terrible thing to do because many times our spirit friends help us both in our progression and in our, in our understanding of what is true and what is false. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to cut that out. So it would be wise for us to then say, well, it is good or wise for us to receive influence from spirits as long as such influence is loving mm -hmm. and is, is truthful. Mm -hmm. But if the influence is unloving or untruthful, yep then obviously it would be very wise if we rejected it. <laughs> Otherwise, we will act upon it and cause some damage to ourselves or others. Yes. And so really all I need to do when it comes to spirit influence is concern myself about unloving spirit influence. Because the loving spirit influence is going to help my life. I only need to be concerned about unloving spirit influence because mm -hmm. that's going to harm my life mm -hmm. and potentially the lives of others that I influence. Mm -hmm. So that's the area that I need to be primarily concerned about. And then the question becomes, well, how can I tell the difference between unloving spirit influence and the conscience? Yes. And most people go, well, what do you mean? The conscience is always going to be loving influence, isn't it? Yes, it is. But often you're going to think it's not because God's opinion of love is different to yours. Yeah. And unfortunately, you're going to think certain spirits are loving when they are not because your opinion of love matches their opinion of love. And, and this is where it gets down to the definition of love that we hold within us. Yeah. If the definition of love that I have within me is the same as the spirits who are unloving, in other words, both I and the spirits who are with me are unloving, then naturally I'm going to agree with them and think that their influence is good, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> naturally. Yeah. And when God's trying to tell me, no, that is not good, I'll, go, I'll be going, no, that's a bad person. That must be a bad spirit trying to tell me that this thing that I'm thinking is good is bad. So it depends on perspective as to which way we will react. And this is why we are poor at determining, we're terrible at determining what is loving influence and what is unloving influence. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is why it's also very tricky for most people to tell the difference between the operation of the conscience and other voices that are coming into their head, <laughs> which are obviously not God, but actually people who are in an unloving condition. There are plenty of people on this world and in the history who have acted, even murdering others, mm -hmm. thinking they're acting in harmony with God's voice yeah. when the reality is that they're acting in harmony with wicked spirits' voices. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I find, I, I just get really overwhelmed by this. You know, I just feel sometimes like um, very frustrated <laughs> <laughs> because I feel that, um, and certainly at times in the past where I do pay a lot of attention to what is good, what is right, what do I, what do I want to do. But you and also pay a lot of attention to what the world thinks. 
That's right. And so... And this is our problem. It's a big problem. Yeah. Because this discernment that you spoke about is highly flawed until we do our own personal work that we mentioned in the previous section. Well, when you say until we do our personal work, let's be more specific. Sure. Until we're willing to enter a state where we're willing to act harmonious with love, no matter what the world thinks. Yes. It's going to be highly flawed, obviously. Yes. And this is where the majority of people have a lot of trouble at the beginning when it comes to listening to their conscience. We are so, ing it's so ingrained into us to listen to what the world says, but also we have he heaps of addictions associated with listening to what the world wants or the family wants, that we cannot listen to what the truth is from God. Mm. And the only way we're going to break through that is to give up, emotionally give up, our desire to hear what the world, you know, to do what the world wants. Well, and I suppose um, this is not about the world necessarily that we're talking about. It's about the influence of spirits, particularly. Well, unloving spirits generally have a very have the same influence really that the world has upon us. Thank you. Yeah, yes. That's... So at the end of the day, we're really talking about the same thing. Yeah. Anybody who influences us negatively, the only way they can influence us negatively is if we are in agreement with their negativity. That's the only way they can really influence us. So, so an example of that, if a spirit wishes to pull you down, the only way you can be influenced by someone pulling you down is that you have a tendency to pull yourself down. You, you know, you have a, a tendency to look down upon yourself. And, you know, the only way someone you look up to can influence you in the world is if you look up to them. If, if you see them as equals, then they can't influence you as much. Now, of course, it's worth looking up to somebody who is in a state of love that you aspire to be in. But if you're looking up to somebody who's not in a state of love and instead is in a, in a poor condition, then you're going to aspire to be that. Mm -hmm. And if you aspire to be that, you will help be helped to be that by the people around you, whether those people can be seen or whether they're unseen. Yeah. So, so I don't feel very frustrated about this myself. <laughs> and my feelings are it's quite clear to me that if I have God's definition of love, and if I'm aspiring to have God's definition of love, I will easily be able to see the difference between negative spirit influence and communication that is positive, I, whether that, come, that comes from God or from spirits who are positive. If I aspire to be selfish, if I aspire, aspire to have selfish motivations, if I aspire to feed my addictions, if I aspire to avoid my pain, if I aspire to have pleasure rather than pain, then naturally I will be influenced by whether they're by people who I can see or, or not see into doing unloving things. And to me, that is quite clear. Like the key is to give up the aspirations that are unloving and to give up the desire to avoid your own pain. Now, Anybody who has not yet given up their de de desire to avoid pain is going to be very confused in this regard, very confused, and also very frustrated when they come to determining the difference. But if you can get to the stage where you're willing to feel your own pain and you're not going to engage pleasure unless you are certain that it's loving, then you won't be confused anymore. You, it'll be quite clear to you what kind of influences you're under. And I think it's very important to point that out to people who are listening. If you're confused, it's only your addictions and your unloving desires that are confusing you. That's all it is. And so when you say you're confused, it's only your desire to avoid pain that causes confusion. It's only your desire to get pleasure rather than pain that causes confusion. If you are open to hearing everything from God, whether it, it, acting upon it is pleasurable or painful for you, then it won't, you won't be confused anymore. You'll be able to easily tell the difference. I find it quite easy to tell the difference as to whether I'm getting influenced by spirits or influenced by God. And I feel everybody will find it easy if they have that internal sense of ethics and morality 
guiding a lot of their choices and decisions. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I don't need, we don't need to talk about me because that's just, uh, I didn't fully express what I feel and doesn't really matter. So you fully but, express what you feel then? <laughs> no, no, it's not so much. I think um, I have personal emotions about spirits that come up for me and affect my mediumship and so well, on and so forth. Well, let's be more specific. The average person on the planet has fear about talking about spirits. Yes. Influencing them negatively. Yes. Yeah. And you have that to a large degree because in the first century you were influenced by spirits and that is something that you're afraid of. And until you address that fear, you will always going to have a degree of like fear, you know, worry about who, who's influencing me now. I think... Um, uh, I have some emo emotional pain about um, having been influenced a lot in my life now and in the first century. I, I have agree. a lot of sadness about that. And I also have a feeling that um, my desire to do good and be good has often been heavily manipulated by darker influences. See, I can't agree with that. I can't agree with that. It has been influenced or manipulated, but it can only be influ influenced or manipulated via your addictions. Absolutely. And, and one of the primary addictions you had when I met you was the addiction to avoid personal emotional pain. Yes. Right. So, so naturally, that addiction is going to have a heavy influence on the negative. So while you might, you also had, at the time I met you, a desire to do good, you also had the desire to avoid your painful emotions yes in fact i didn't the same I didn't time. understand how much of an impact uh, suppressed emotion had upon my demeanor i was raised that's, as most people are to feel yeah. that there's a complete that's um, right yeah lack of correlation between the two so yeah. to my mind it is understandable that you would have been in a state of confusion at that point you see because on one hand there's the desire for goodness inside of a person which many people have Right. But on the other hand, there's also a desire to avoid their personal pain, mm -hmm. which means that you're highly manipula mani manipulatable. If that's yes. such a word. Yeah. You can be manipulated yeah. easily yeah. if you have a high desire to avoid personal pain. So, so on one hand, you've got a desire to do good, but on the other hand, a desire to avoid pain, which also exposes you to manipulation. Now, under those circumstances, it will be quite confusing because on one hand, the desire to go feel good, God can communicate mm -hmm. with that, influence you to do some good. But on the other hand, the spirits and the people around you are manipulating you in the negative and you're willing to avoid personal pain. So you'll go ahead with what they want and therefore be distracted from the good, if you, if you could say. Yes. Mm. And I think what, um, what comes up for me a lot as we discuss the conscience is that the answer to hearing the conscience to me is it's always exactly the same as the answer to having a relationship with god it's it's always exactly the same answer to most of the issues that surround uh, not, our i don't know if i would agree because i feel the answer to hearing the conscience is a bit different than the answer to acting upon the conscience because <laughs> <laughs> I, I do feel most people hear their conscience you know, at, at different times in particular, mo a lot of people are humble under certain circumstances and also they have a desire for truth under certain circumstances, even though that desire might not be highly developed. So, so a lot of times we hear the conscience. The problem is we dismiss it. We don't act upon it. And that is certainly, you know, about other considerations such as ethics, morality, also the desire to love and the desire for faith and things like that, as we've discussed. So there's a difference in my mind to hearing it and acting upon it. And I feel through your life, there's plenty of times where you've heard it, but you haven't acted upon it and you've dismissed it readily. And I feel the same could be said for me and other people too. Um, and that now doesn't confuse me because I'm in a state, well, of course that's going to happen mm -hmm. because every time my addictions are confronted or every time my desire for pleasure is confronted or every time my desire for avoidance of pain is confronted naturally the thing i'm going to listen to the most is the unloving thing 
the thing that I'm being influenced to do by others. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, I could, I could launch into a whole lot of other questions that are not on our outline now. So I think let's return and I can add them to a later, a later session because we are going to have one next. Yeah, um, but it's very important, I feel here, that the questions aren't based around fear because it, cause what I notice is a lot of questions when we enter these kind of discussions are based around your fear about something. And, and this is what I notice about many of my discussions with people when we do seminars is that frequently the discussion centres around their fear rather than about the truth about something. So I, so, so I feel, so for example, I feel that most people ask questions based around their fears, not around the desire for truth. They're afraid that something will happen and we'd be much better off asking a question saying, I'm afraid of this, <laughs> mm -hmm. rather than saying, but what about this and what about that? Or uh, so trying to avoid the fact that we are afraid of a certain thing. And, and I feel now in this discussion, you're avoiding the fact that we're afra you're afraid of certain things. And, and the key is to say what you're afraid of. Yes. So, and then you can have a discussion about that rather than saying, rather than rephrasing the questions as to what about this and what about that, when really the questions are, I'm afraid about this happening to me is really <laughs> the real question. Do you know what I mean? Yes, I suppose. And I suppose, uh, to be fair, I don't know if I asked many questions, but I did say I'm very frustrated. And perhaps I would have been more. You're making clear to personal say, comments about yes. your opinion about the conscience, right? Your yep. frustration about yep. the conscience. Yeah. And yep. these particular personal opinions are based around your fears. Yes. They're not based around what is true about the conscience. And past sadness. And. And correct, correct. And past decisions and choices and, yes. and so forth are based yes. around that, your personal experience. Yes. Now, I've got no problem having a discussion about the personal experience, but we've got to see it for what it is. Yes. It's, a, it's because of certain factors inside the person that these questions are being asked or these statements are being made, and they have no bearing on the truth regarding the conscience. They have a bearing on the person's experience of the conscience yes. because of the different factors that are involved inside of them. And we've got to be very careful here that we don't go making a whole heap of comments that are either negative or positive, because some of your comments are negative, straight out negative. And, and we've got to be careful that that's not just because of your personal opinion about what you feel are misgivings about analysis of conscience in the past or whatever problems you've had with it in the past that you're then imposing on the audience. Absolutely. You see what I'm saying? Yes, I so, do. So I feel quite strongly that what I'm stating quite clearly is this. If you have developed those primary designs, which we've already listed, and you've worked through removing the external influence that we've already re re listed, it will be very clear to you what the conscience is, and when you're hearing it, when you're not, it will be mm. with, with no doubt whatsoever. God is not equivocal about that matter. <laughs> Any like unknown factors about the matter are caused by our condition. And we must, we must acknowledge that. They're not caused by the mechanism being faulty. No. And they're not caused by God. And it is not, un it is not, uh, indeterminate and we need to see it as that yes and if we're not careful here when people hear some of your comments they go oh maybe all the conscience is so mary's having trouble with her conscience so it's all indeterminate no it isn't no and it's not i'm sorry that was not my intention to give yeah. that impression yeah, yeah it's not indeterminate the conscience works the same way for all people god has a large part to play in the operation of the conscience and, and the answer isn't like you said, you said that the answer is the same as having a relationship with God. No, it isn't because you don't have to have a relationship with God to hear your conscience. You don't. God can share God's truth with you whether you, and whether you act upon it or, or listen to it or not is immaterial. The mechanism of the conscience exists and God is sharing truth with you right now, no matter who you are, no matter what condition you're in, and no matter whether you want a relationship with God or not, God's still doing it. And the, the less damage has happened to the soul, the more God's able to do it. Right? 
So it's not the same as having a relationship with God. It can help you have a relationship with God. We need to make sure that everyone is clear on this fact that developing the conscience doesn't require a relationship with God. No. It requires that you're just willing to listen to God's opinion, <laughs> which is a different thing altogether. And, and that's the same as listening to anyone's opinion, if you think about it. Like, my openness to listening to your opinion depends on a variety of factors, and we don't have to have a relationship. There are people on the telly <laughs> who can share their opinion with you, and you'll accept it without having a relationship with them. So the same applies to this thing with God. Yes, and I, again, yeah. I, I didn't explain fully my comment. My comment was very, very personal, and I apologise for using this forum for it. Yeah. It was not the appropriate thing to do. Yeah, it so was, it's about my personal frustrations about where I go wrong in both areas. And, and yes, uh, well, I, I feel this is a very good discussion to have about your personal frustrations about it. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? No. Well, 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 <laughs> I of feel like this is. is a bad discussion to have. No, there, no, yeah. no, it's a good discussion, but it has to be in the right context. It's great to say what your frustrations are about connecting with conscience uh -huh. because it's the same kind of frustrations that the majority of people are going to have. Which is why I expressed it. Which yeah. is, but, yeah. but, but no, you're, no, you didn't express it like that. Sorry. You expressed it like as if you were stating a truth, which is, a, which is the issue I have with it. I understand. When, when you express it as, no, I have some frustrations here, yeah. and this is what I feel, that's yeah. different. But you were actually saying, no, it seems that it's very hard to determine. No, it isn't very hard. It's very hard for you. That's different. <laughs> yes. That's different than it being very hard. No, God's actually made it very easy. The reason why it's hard for us as individuals, there are many reasons and we, we can discuss them. Yeah. But don't, like, I don't, I feel whenever anybody goes, oh, but it all sounds, you know, very indeterminate, very hard, and it's just the same as having a relationship with God anyway, I've just got to do the same things. No, none of that is true. Mm -hmm. And I can't agree with it. Mm -hmm. But those things need to be discussed if that's a way that people think. I well, agree yes. with that. I do feel I do feel that a lot of um, so my comment came off the back of you sort of talking about how when when we have these problems with love and a lack of desire to feel our pain, we don't differentiate between what is a spirit influence and we're apt to call spirit influence conscience and that's what I heard you saying. No, I said no I said <laughs> We don't want to differentiate, That's right. yes. <laughs> which is different than we don't differentiate. Yes. The reality is that when you're talking to one person and then you're talking to another person, you can tell the difference. When you're feeling emotions from one person and feeling emotions from another person, you can tell the difference. You are able to tell the difference yes. no matter what your condition. Yes. It's whether you want to or not. Yes. That is the real question. Yes. And for most of us, we don't want to. So, so we've got to be careful here too. We've got to stop saying, to ourselves, oh, I just can't do it because of this and that, and, and and almost imply that it's something to do wrong with the laws and wrong with God and wrong with the yeah. mechanism, when actually it's to do with our demands and desires that are causing it to go wrong. Yeah. And we need to be very clear about that, I feel. Yes, and my frustrations are very much with myself. Um, I feel... I, I don't feel, though, that they are unique to yourself. Right, yeah. Your frustrations are certainly with yourself, and most people, when it comes to developing the conscious, have similar frustrations, and therefore they're not unique frustrations, mm -hmm. but they all come about because of one of the things we've already mentioned, one of the factors we've already yes. mentioned, whether it be external influences or the lack of desire. Mm -hmm. It comes about from one of those two factors. There's no other influencing factors. Yes. Yeah. You know, uh, yes, yeah. and and I um, I don't know how to proceed in the conversation now because I really came from a very emotional place. I can't even remember what I was saying, <laughs> and I responded very much to something that you said. And I understand I need to choose my words a little more carefully in that place. But I don't know how to talk to you about it anymore because I'm like, <laughs> oh, uh, there's just a lot of emotion going on for me now about. Um, it's specifically to do with spirit influence, and that is something that is in, perhaps more unique to me. Uh, I don't know. No, but, I, I feel uh, I feel there's 
the majority of people on the planet are heavily spirit influenced. My feeling is write down the questions and we deal with them in questions <laughs> about the conscience instead of talking about it as truth. When you make some of these statements, you, you feel it as true. You do. You, right, yes. You feel that it's hard to determine what the conscience is and what it isn't. You feel that. I don't. No. You do. You do for reasons. Uh, you we know, can discuss those reasons, yes. but, but, but we need to not imply to the audience that those reasons are, are true, because they're not true. I agree. They're, they're just factors that are part of the individual's injuries and condition and addictions and yes. desires yes. that cause uh, a feeling to occur rather than it being actually true. Yes. Yeah. And yes. we need to see that. Yeah, you know. yeah, and in my in, in my less triggered moments, I I see that very clearly. In fact, I see, I do see. Oh gosh, I'm not listening to God right now because you know I'm feeling worse and worse, and I'm doing more and more damaging things. Like I can I can discern that, um, but I'm not very good at because of personal blocks that I have with God, in particular, I'm not very. Um, Yeah, I don't feel very tuned to my conscience, but I don't know if that's an accurate representation of myself either. See, I, I would say you don't want to be. Yeah. And I've talked to you about this privately before, about yeah. not wanting a relationship with God for specific reasons yeah. that you're yet to feel about. Yeah. To my mind, every person has a connection with God through the conscience. It's not a relationship. It's a, it's a receiver. It's a mechanism of hearing communication so every person has it if you're detuned from it there's reasons there's always reasons yes. and in your case there's strong reasons very and uh, when i say strong reasons there's reasons about why you know i don't wish to be in connection with god yeah, yeah you have a large amount of grief associated with a loss of connection with god along with a large amount of fear, fear about, about it, it. Yeah. and so naturally any connection with god is going to be resisted and therefore you end up in a state of confusion because you're resisting it and you've got to be careful that you don't see that as a that you see that the state of uh, confusion is the result of the resistance rather than thinking it's something to do with the mechanism itself or the I confusion do. about how the mechanism runs because no, it's not about it's that. not and i and that's what i see very clearly which which is what raised my comment it's the same as my relationship with God as with the conscience is because it was a very personal comment about I know that my resistance, my grief and my fear about having a relationship with God is creating problems for me in terms of tuning into the conscience, but also in terms of having a personal relationship with God. It's the same factors that create a lot of my frustration. Yeah, I don't know if I'd agree. It's exactly the same factors because there's different factors. But sure. But I also feel that that's the same for most people. You know, most people have been brought up on this planet to not have a relationship with God. We've we've said very clearly at the beginning of a lot of this conversation that that most people have been brought up to, for the parents to replace God's laws within their heart. In other words, they've been brought up to view their parents as God. Mm -hmm which is something that is, have you've been severely affected by. <laughs> yes. So, so, so the majority of people on this planet have a huge problem with the relationship with God and listening to God because there is a deep and abiding rule set within them already that says, I must first listen to my parents. I must first think that whatever they say is God. Whatever they say is right is right. Whatever they say is wrong is wrong. And this underlying feeling that the majority of people have, which is, which is based upon the parent forcing upon the child the parent's view of life, mm -hmm. right, has caused a huge detourment to the conscience, which we've already discussed. We have. And, and that is a severe limiting factor upon most people's operation of the conscience. Most people are still trying to get even though they might no longer be living with their parents and feel angry about their parents and what the parents have done, they are still connected to the parent being the rule maker, the lawmaker, rather than God. Or they see God as their parents. 
in other words, the same unloving, cranky, punishing person that their parents were, right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. both things have a severe impact upon the operation of the conscience, obviously. Yeah. So, but there, there are always factors. It's not indeterminate. We can always find what the cause is yes. to the influences upon the conscience and cure them. Yes. Uh, and remove them. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> you, you don't know what to give come on, but I don't know what let's, to do. let's go back to the spirit influence shall we <laughs> which is the area that you that triggered me in the first place so let's see how so that was goes. a big digression but let's go back to the spirit influence because the spirit influence thing is what is triggering you here yes it is and frankly it triggers most people yes most people are very afraid that they're being influenced by people they can't see ironically they don't care that they're being influenced heavily by people they can see. So I find that quite, in some ways, quite unethical. We're more worried about the people we can't see and how they're influencing us than we are worried about the people we can see who are influencing us badly. So, so it's the same. A person who can influence us face to face mm -hmm. is the same kind of person who can influence us when we can't see them mm -hmm. because the injuries have to be a specific kind of injury in that person and in me in order to allow that person to be able to influence me and whether i can see them or not they will still have the same influence so why is it that i'm more concerned about the spirit influence than i am about the face-to-face -face influence so i don't well, understand that to me, the spirit influence and the face-to-face -face influence are the same. If I have an injury of a certain type, I will expose myself to the same influences. Now, I suppose the only difference is I can remove the, physically remove, the face-to-face -face interaction with that face-to-face -face person who's living on Earth and think that that now has removed the influence. But it hasn't. My injury is the thing that exposes me to the influence. And drives my behaviour. Naturally. Yeah. And this is why we said in terms of removing the external influences that all the work that has to be done is internal. Mm. <laughs> because it's the internal injuries that determine who's influencing me. Because also um, we seek we seek influences sometimes. Un like un we don't think that, but... We're, we because sometimes we even seek these very damaging influences because it's meeting um, uh, an error-based definition within ourselves or a... Um, Let's be more specific and then give examples. We often seek um, external influences because we don't want to make a decision. We, yes. we don't want to be responsible for the outcome. We want to make somebody else responsible for the outcome. And there are people in the world who are willing to be responsible for our life as long as we do what they want and um, you know and we will naturally give them our lives under those circumstances yeah. and do what they want we're, to the point where we're willing to go off to war for them you know mm -hmm. we're willing to kill others and also have ourselves be killed for the sake of their influence like at the end of the day we are influenced only by what we're avoiding internally and what about this this um, idea that we so you mentioned earlier about the parental influence yep uh, causing us to you know we be you, predisposed predisposed to influences of a similar nature in our adult life yep yep um, and so, say for someone like me, who never really went through a rebellion against their parents, mm -hmm. never really became their own individual, if you like, d developmentally, maybe you would say that. I, I have now. And yeah, no, I, I feel in your 30s, you've gone in through your 30s. rebellion. <laughs> but most people do it in their teenage years. Probably. But I didn't do it in anger. I didn't do my rebellion in anger. No. I did it Which very, is good, because yes. if you did it in anger, you'd end up doing a lot of opposite things that you didn't want to do either. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. I feel in my 30s I've taken definite steps to become my own person, yeah. which is different to rebellion. Rebellion is very often 
completely doing the polar opposite of our parents just because we're experimenting with becoming our own person right. and trying to figure out who we want to be. Yeah. Where I didn't do that in my teens or my 20s very yeah. much. And in my 30s, I've just taken solid steps. It took me to 33 to do the same. So <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, leading to a point about conscience, um, because of that, though, I've clearly I had some very strong injuries to do with pleasing, <laughs> pleasing my parents and trying to become the definition of what they thought was a good person. Not just pleasing. Also, your worth associated with other people approving of you. Yes. And so, so it's not it's not just usually one set of injuries. It's usually a whole combination, which your parents have created yep. in order to maintain control. But obviously, because I hadn't become my own person, all of my worth was based on doing what other people said because I hadn't developed my own sense of self-worth. Yes. It, was, it was just yes. a, not a healthy place to be yep. living. Um, but because of that injury, it seems to me that now being confronted with seeking out externally, for the conscience to hear from God directly. What, what is the right thing to do here? Not just based on my logic and reasoning now, but what, what are you saying? Um, yeah, I, I feel it, we need to go back to our outline because it's got the four points that okay. I want to, <laughs> <laughs> want to raise about this Good. externally and we haven't discussed them. Let's do but, it. But, but I feel that for the majority of people here, if you are confused, it's natural that you are confused. There, you know, there are, there are so many competing influences upon a child's attention that by the time a child is even seven or eight years of age, most of the time, the quietest influence, which was God's, has been drowned out and, and stifled by parental and society influences. And that, that's a normal fact of life. The key is reversing it. And during the reversal process, Obviously, you can see already from our discussion that it requires a lot of sincere dealing with and releasing certain emotions in order to reverse the process. And while we're halfway through the state, we're not a good, uh, we're not in a good state of analysis as to what the conscience is, because because we're yet to do a lot of the work needed to release why I can't hear it and what's going on and who am I really listening to most of the time. Once we've worked our way through those emotions, we will have a much, you could say, a much better ability, a much more tuned in ability to be able to hear what God's saying to us and respond to it because we do not have all those influences still having a large demand upon our attention. And I feel that is a very important thing we need to realize. And whether these influences are seen, which the injury began through all only seen influences generally, or majority of them were seen influences. In other words, the injuries were created during our childhood experience, and it was mostly with people we could see, right? And as a result of that, these injuries now also expose us to people we can't see being able to influence us as well, which, which while in itself is distressing, it, it is easily able to be addressed just by removing the same things from the people we could see as well as, and then of course the people we can't see can't influence us anymore either. <laughs> so, so I don't feel it's something to stress out about. I do feel though that it's something to understand and understand the proper way of being able to tell the difference between my conscience mechanism and the influences I'm under from other sources. Yeah. So really there's lots of ways that we can tell the difference between spirit influence and God's truth mm. um, coming to us via the conscience. Could you list some of them for us? Yeah, well, uh, firstly, we need to say, I suppose, as I said just earlier, that when spirits communicate with us, there are there is a whole heap of non-verbal, if you could call it that, communication going on. Mm. But a lot of times the spirits are not aware that that communication is going on. It's, it's a bit like people on Earth when you meet people on Earth uh, who are communicating with you. Frequently they're not aware of all the mannerisms and the things that are going on 
that are not verbal, but that indicate to you their particular feelings and their emotions and their thoughts as well. Mm -hmm. You know, quite often I get people having a sneer on their face when they talk to me. So yeah. I know that, you know, most of the time they either don't like me or whatever. <laughs> it's like, so it, it's easy enough to tell, you know, when you've got a person standing in front of you. Mm -hmm. So so I don't want people to sort of misquote uh, the next bit that I'm going to say. But okay. what I'm going to say is that God communicates only via soul to soul. Mm -hmm. So so all the communication is via soul to this soul-based mechanism, mm -hmm. which is the conscience, mm -hmm. and the communication occurs. So this is not the same as the communication that occurs through the love connection, which is the Holy Spirit yep. communication. Yep. This communication is just the communication from God's, you could say, mind, mm -hmm. God's, God's thoughts about matters into you know, our mind, our soul's mind, though. Mm -hmm. And... And that is an, an emotional communication pathway. It's uh, controlled by emotions. It, it, it's limited by emotions and it's also uh, opened up through healing certain emotions. Yeah. Most of the time spirits who are in disharmony with God, and remember we've said, we said that just earlier that, you know, we need to be concerned only about yeah. the spirits who are being unloving. Yeah. So we don't need to worry about the spirits of being loving because obviously if we listen to their influence, it's going to be fine. But yeah. the, the spirits who are unloving, we need to be concerned about their influence. Now, spirits who are unloving generally uh, like to drop thoughts first into you, you, but they also have a lot of emotions that come with it. But they're, they're also trying to influence your mind because most of them believe that if they can influence your thoughts, then they can influence your behavior. Mm -hmm. They don't understand that the way they can influence your behavior through influencing your thoughts is because of your unhealed emotions. So they don't uh -huh. get that part of it. They just think that all I've got to do is suggest to somebody long enough mm -hmm. to kill themselves that eventually they'll go and do it. Mm. They don't realize that the only way the suggestion to kill yourself comes from a spirit to you is by you having a certain set of angers or other sorts of emotions that expose you to acting upon the thought that you receive. So, sorry, so is it the case that you you only respond, like the spirit could suggest it to five people, but if four people um, don't have the right emotional condition, they won't respond, but Correct. someone with an injured condition uh, a certain injured condition might respond to that suggestion. Correct. And they don't understand that per se. Yes. They know that a certain colour that emanates off the spirit body indicates that they can make a suggestion and the person might follow through. Mm -hmm. And and whether that suggestion be to hurt yourself or harm another or, you know, have sex with somebody or whatever the suggestion is that, yeah. that is out of harmony with love. So when we look at this situation first about God's communication versus communication with from spirits, you can see that the majority of the time the spirits are trying to drop thoughts. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, most of the thoughts are going to be in harmony with your false beliefs or your addictions. Yes. So they're going to be all to, to do something that is unloving from God's perspective. So, so we need to understand that the communication mechanisms, when we receive things like this that just pop into our head, mm -hmm. that don't have any relationship to our current emotions, yeah. and they don't have any real relationship to our current thoughts, mm -hmm. then most probably it's a spirit popping that thought into our mind. Yeah. To receive communication from God that we're aware of and for, via the conscience, there needs to be a question that's asked yeah. through an interaction, of course. Yeah. And then there's sort of like almost, you could say, a soul-based dialogue. Uh, uh, thoughts come to you as a result of feelings that pass through you mm -hmm. that, that then indicate to you what are God's thoughts about the matter if you're open to receiving them, mm. which is a very different communication pathway than what most spirits employ to give us damaging messages that we then act upon. So there you're really saying if we have a heart-based seeking for an answer, mm -hmm. for, the, for the truth, for God's truth, mm -hmm. then we'll, we'll receive, the, the conscience should respond, or sorry, the conscience is already operating, but we should feel a response in terms of a conscience. Uh, is that what you mean? Like we'll hear from God about it? 
You'll hear from God about it, but it it won't be like clear words because because all of God's communications come through emotion first. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. so it'll fl- there'll be a flow of some emotion from God, which will indicate His feelings about the matter, and that will be translated into words or thoughts that you can respond to. And you go, ah, you know that that certainly certainly wrong. So is it wrong to kill somebody? The majority of people, if they just ask that question. They'll have a you. You'll feel a feeling in you that oh yes, it's definitely wrong. Yeah. Like and there's no even at that point there's no real reason given. Yes. Even. Yes. But there is a feeling that the majority of people have, which is the reason why we have laws against murdering people, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because the majority of people have the same response to that same emotion that comes from God. It is, when they ask the question, is it wrong? The response is yes, it is wrong, mm-hmm. and and the average person can actually sense that. But when it comes to another question, like, is it wrong to kill people in war? Yes. Right? Now, the majority of people are now open to other thoughts now. Yeah. Right? Besides the thoughts that come from God. Mm -hmm. And these other thoughts are thoughts about survival, you know, which is a fear-based thing. Yeah. Thoughts about what's going to happen to your family if you don't fight, Mm -hmm. fear-based thing. Thoughts about what's going to happen to you if you don't fight, what your friends and your neighbours and other people will think. Mm. Thoughts about, you know, the other race that you're fighting, you know, what, you know, you might have angry thoughts about them, for yeah. example. Yeah. Now, th- all of those thoughts now uh, can be heightened mm-hmm. by spirits who are obviously in agreement with those thoughts or who want you to act upon those thoughts and turn them into actions. Yeah. Now, at that moment, you are now more detuned from what God's still saying, because God's still saying it's still wrong. Yeah. And if anybody is really open to God, they'll know that, that yeah. God's still saying it's wrong. Yeah. Right? As God did before, when, yes. you know, when you asked the first question, is yeah. it right to murder? Yeah. But there are so many other influences now mm-hmm. that are societal, parental, racial based influences, yeah. belief systems that are, that are already within you that now preclude God's thought coming to you. Mm-hmm. And now the spirit thought is able to enter you. Yeah. Or your own addictions are able to be fed through the thoughts you have yourself. Either way, to act upon them would be unloving because mm-hmm. you'd recognise, oh, I'm still trying to kill somebody. There's something wrong with that, yeah. even though I agree with the idea there's obviously something wrong with that. Yeah. You know, you, 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 logic would dictate that you would have that analysis, but emotions are dictating otherwise. Uh-huh. Right? Uh-huh. And so, spirits can get involved in that mix, you're saying. That's yeah. right, yeah. yeah. So, so you could say that the, frequently um, when it comes to our thoughts being influenced by spirits, frequently, uh, firstly, they're influenced by spirits often when we're not thinking about those subjects. Mm-hmm. So where we're not asking a question directly or seeking an answer, you mean? Or? Yeah, we're yeah. just, we're just uh, you know, we're just living our normal life and something pops up into mm-hmm. our head and we think, oh, that's a great idea, go ahead and do that, not realising a lot of times that this has been suggested by a spirit. And more concerningly, it doesn't matter if it's suggested by a good spirit but or someone who's got our best interests at heart, But if it's suggested by someone who hasn't, then obviously we could do some terrible things acting upon their suggestion. The second thing in this aspect is when we are in a dialogue of asking, Mm -hmm. we often receive contrary information. So when God shares, for example, in the example I gave, we ask about murder and there's a definite feeling in the majority of people on the planet that it's wrong. Then we ask about war and there's a definite feeling in the in majority of people that they don't really know, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Where there's contrary information, contrary, when I say information, there's information coming from yourself going, but what if I'm in this situation? Or what if mm-hmm. I'm in this situation? Or what if I'm in that situation? Then surely I can do it then. Mm-hmm. Which are all fears. Yeah. Which we're not necessarily recognizing as fears and seeing them, they can't come from God. Those, those thoughts can't come from God. Yeah. They must come from other sources. Yeah. And this is the this is what we need to start measuring it when we if we're going to be sensitive to conscience in comparison to sensitive to spirit influence, we need to start measuring is the thought based on fear? Is the thought based on love? Mm-hmm. Is the thought based on truth or fear? Mm-hmm. Is, a, is a thought based on harming someone or helping someone? Is the thought based on like getting what we want 
or getting what everybody wants. Yeah. You know, what, yeah. you know, these are the these are the kinds of things we need to look at. So you're sort of talking about an analysis of really what we already know of God's love and truth against yeah. what we're what we're hearing. You can't prevent thoughts from popping in your mind. Mm-hmm. God's designed the human soul to be open to receiving information from mm-hmm. God and from other sources. Uh, we can't stop the flow of information. We've got to, we, but we do have the ability to choose and determine whether that information is loving or not. Mm. And we certainly have that ability and mm-hmm. everyone's got that ability too. Mm-hmm. And again, that ability can be, you know, obviously influenced by childhood experiences, yeah. but everyone has the ability. Yeah. There's plenty of people who have been abused as children who know that being abused is wrong. Yeah. They don't go and abuse other children yeah. when they're adults, you know, yeah. when they become an adult, abuse another child. another child. So there's plenty of people who know that something is wrong even when, you know, it, as children, they've been told that it's right. Yeah. So where did they get that information from? They mm. obviously know through the connection with ethics and morality and a connection with some other source telling them that, no, it was wrong. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and this is a common thing, but we frequently don't respond to God's messages yeah. when we have inve- a vested interest in following other messages. Yes, mm. yes. All right, well, just to summarise some of what you said there, I'll read out what you wrote in the outline because it's quite good. Yeah. And then maybe you can take us on to a couple of the other points that sure. you wanted to make. So you said, God communicates via the soul as emotions and feelings, while, spir- while spirits in disharmony with God communicate via thoughts. If- of course, they still have feelings. Yes. Which we often can feel. Uh-huh. But, but. Their way of working with us is generally to drop ideas, concepts, ideas. thoughts. So they affect our thought patterns more than our emotions? Well, they, they know then... that if you're open emotionally to that thought pattern, you probably act on it. Mm-hmm. Mm. So it's sort of a top, they, they heighten our thoughts and that heightens our emotions and then we end up acting. Yeah. 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 Okay. If we receive thoughts that seem to pop into our head with no relationship to our current train of thinking or our emotions, no matter what the content, we need to assume that spirits are the source. Hmm. So now that we know that spirits are the source, well, we can evaluate what the information is. We can say, <laughs> is, it, is that good information or is that just fear-based information? What is it? If yeah. it's good information, then what, you'd still probably act upon it if you wanted to. Yes. But yeah. if, it, if it's fear-based information or untruthful or unethical or immoral, or mm-hmm. then it, you'd be best to choose not to. Mm. 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 Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. The, the next thing, do you want me to raise the next thing you had written down there? And, well, no, uh, I can do that. Yeah. And, and it's all of God's thoughts and feelings are in harmony with truth. Mm-hmm. Right? And all of them are in harmony with love. So mm-hmm. God's truth is always in harmony with love. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's never unloving. Yes. Never unloving. Yeah. So if I have emotions or thoughts inside of me that are not in harmony with what I know God's love to be, mm-hmm. right, then they obviously come from some other source. Yeah. Whether that source is my own feelings mm-hmm. or from suggestions, emotional or intellectual, made by spirits, it's obviously not God. Yeah. So an example of this would be. You know, people hear God's voice telling them to go and murder somebody. <laughs> Obviously not. Yeah. Obviously not. Yeah. It's out of harmony with love, as we learnt from our previous discussion just earlier. And we just had, you know, most people on the planet know that murder is wrong. Yeah. So therefore, most people on the planet are being told that murder is wrong, mm-hmm. <laughs> obviously from some source. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and if that's the case, then, uh, you know, obviously when someone tells us to go and murder and then says it's God telling us, there must be some kind of mistake here, yes. <laughs> and generally the mistake is us believing that yeah. it's God yeah. rather than, than some wicked spirit who's telling us to do such a thing. Yeah. And we ourselves must have some kind of harmony with that emotion yeah. for, inside in, of us for, in, order, in order for us to hear it. Got mm. you. Yeah. So really you're saying here, it sounds like you're saying there's the issue of... Um, the conscience is going to be emotional. It's an emotional connection. Mm-hmm. It may impact. We may have thoughts. We will have thoughts. We will have thoughts. Yep. Um, but usually, it's going. But to it's also a feeling. Like, no, that feels wrong. Wrong. Yeah, you you, you can feel wrong. it as a feeling too. Yeah. 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 So the thoughts and the feelings are quite harmonious on the issue. Very. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, when it comes to spirit influence, one way we can start to discern is that uh, something just popped into my head and I feel a bit compelled to do something now or feel really strongly about this all of a sudden and it's based on some thoughts I just started having. Mm. Um, pretty much that's a, an indication that uh, this is spirit influence. And then in addition now you're saying if, hang on, I'm feeling like really like I should be doing this thing, but it's really in disharmony with what I already know to be loving and truthful from God's perspective. Mm. This is this is not my conscience. No. It's either my emotions or spirit influence. It's either my emotions or spirit influence, yeah. but in, either way, I shouldn't probably act <laughs> yeah, upon yeah. it <laughs> <laughs> because it's obviously out of harmony with love, right? Yeah, choose a different <laughs> so, thing. Yeah, choose yes. a different thing. Yeah. Even if your emotions are saying not to, you mm -hmm. still need to work through the emotional reason. Yeah. So that'd be great too. You work through the emotional reason why you feel some kind of harmony with an unloving thing. Yeah. But uh, obviously, whether it's from spirits or yourself, you really need to learn how to choose a different thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess that's where the morality uh, comes in that you've spoken about. If, we, if we're not that concerned with morality, we'll go, well, I don't really want to choose a different thing right now. Yeah, or uh, love of self. There's a whole heap of areas, yeah. really. Love of self could be one of them. So spirits often influence you to do something unloving to yourself. Mm. You know, mm. whether it's have sex with someone you don't love or care for, or yeah. whether it's eating too much or drinking too much, you know, like alcoholism, mm -hmm. drinking mm -hmm. too much, drugs, to, you know, that kind of stuff. Spirits are often influencing people to, to engage these addictions. And so anything that's out of harmony with love of self is yeah. quite obvious out of harmony with God's love for you. Yeah. Therefore, quite obvious, not God's truth. Yeah. Therefore, if you're hearing it as voices telling you to do it, like many people do, mm -hmm. uh, then obviously it's spirits who are telling you to do those things. Okay. Mm. All right. A mm. um, couple more things you had noted here. Mm -hmm. God's truth received through the conscience is always just a communication of truth. Yeah, now this is a very important part of it. A lot of people, when they hear something from spirits, feel impelled to do it. Like they, they just have to do it. Mm. They, they can't help themselves. We have lots of people doing this via email with us yeah. where they just can't help but write an email, a spirit influenced email. You know, mm -hmm. they just got to say a whole heap of things and, and you can block one email because they're being unloving. They'll just create another one, do it again and yeah. block, you block that one. They create another one, do it again. This is an indication of a very unloving person who's also very spirit influenced yeah. because you, you can't even say no to them yeah. and, and, and they'll still try to make you listen to what they got to say. Yeah. So, so these kind of people are obviously heavily spirit influenced to be unloving, mm. They're taking action to be unloving. So here we're saying that with God, God's just communicating the truth. He's not forcing you to do anything. He's not mm. trying to force you either to listen. Yeah. So anytime somebody is forcing you to listen or trying to force you to do something, whether that person is seen or unseen, mm -hmm. the person is obviously unloving. Yeah. So if you feel impelled to do something, pushed into doing it, yeah. uh, whoever's pushing you is an unloving person, whether that person is someone who's face to face or someone who's, you know, like unseen. Unseen. Mm. Got you. Yeah. So uh, we, we've got to be very careful about the impulsion, you know, being impul impelled. Yeah. These impulsions that we have that, you know, that are like almost like a frenzy to, to do, you yeah. know. And, and a, a lot of them are in themselves bad in the sense that they're not, uh, you know, doing something damaging to another person. Sometimes, oftentimes they are, but sometimes they're not. But, but frequently they are very damaging to ourselves because what we finish up doing is putting ourselves in the power of somebody who can later influence us to do damaging things. Mm. So many spirits try this with stuff that is innocent first. Mm -hmm. So they, they give information, provide you know, details about people and so forth. And initially it might sound, and, and we've imperiled to act upon it, mm -hmm. and initially it might sound very good, you know, uh, but they do, many of them do that just to gain a foothold. Yeah. And once they've gotten a foothold, they then they start getting more insistent mm -hmm. and pressuring to do more damaging things to ourselves or others. So it's sort of like build, they um, 
create a sense of trust in the person that they're influencing that their influence is beneficial to that person yes and then um that person then gradually lead that person down a path that is um unloving and based upon meeting the selfish desires of the spirit involved and the selfish desires of the person yeah as well often yeah. Yeah. But frequently I've seen people do that who initially started out with no desire to suicide, for example. Mm -hmm. They get a bit spirit influenced, they start having, they start taking certain, they trust these spirits, they start trusting the words they're hearing and so forth. And the spirits get them to do specific things and they trust that and they go, oh, that all come true, you know, so that establishes more trust and so forth. Mm. Until the point now that the spirit is starting to suggest unloving things. Yeah. And, and once that happens, many times the people will continue to do the unloving things mm. as well. Mm. Not, not stopping and pausing and going, hang on a sec. No, that suggestion was pretty bad. Yeah. Uh, well, why, why am I now listening? There's something going on now. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of times they've gone too far in their trust level, I suppose yeah. you say frequently, to actually re ver reverse the choices and decisions. Yeah. But they can always do it, of course. You can always reverse any choice and decisions. The key is to assess the level of love in the suggestions being made. Got you. Mm. Yeah. Something you had written here <coughs> as well, perhaps just to finish off that point, is if we feel impelled to action without understanding why, then it is highly likely this indication comes from a spirit or this instruction. Yes. Now, again, if the impulsion to action is a loving action, yeah. Then obviously a nice spirit is saying, you should do this, you should do this, you should do this. And they're quite, being quite insistent, right? Now, obviously, if they're trying to force us to do it, then that, that would indicate they're probably not that loving. Yeah. But if they, if they are just, you know, regularly prompting us to do it, then you could say, and it's a loving thing they're prompting us to do, then why wouldn't you go ahead and do it? Obviously, they know something you don't know, and mm. it's probably a good suggestion. You'll see... And you'll see in the doing whether, you know, whether it was or not, uh, whether, whether there was something else involved that was a benefit or not, you know. But when the impulsion, you know, when the uh, suggestion is unloving, mm -hmm. to do an unloving thing, mm -hmm. either to serve your own selfish ambitions, desires, emotions or addictions, or to serve the selfish ambitions, desires, emotions or addictions of others, mm. uh, obviously you're going to end up in a place that's not that good for you. Yeah. Right now on Earth, but also after you pass. Yeah. Mm. But but you do have to have some analysis of what's loving and unloving, as you've mentioned previously. Yes. A lot, a lot of, of us are injured and yeah. can tell ourselves it's loving when it's not. That's so. right. But yeah. although that being that we tell ourselves it's loving when when it's not, but if we're really honest with ourselves, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. you know a lot, this, this, a lot less grey area, isn't there? Exactly. Yeah. There's a lot yeah. less grey area than we would like to believe yeah and often we like to believe there's gray area because it allows us to get away with unloving unloving things yeah 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 and frequently a way to tell is to ask ourselves would we like that thing done to us yeah you know that's an ethical question that we need to ask ourselves mm -hmm. and if we ask that question we go oh no you know what was being suggested i do to them would you like it done to you probably not so don't do it then you know yeah. to the other person yeah. no yeah. matter how in, Pulsive, you feel about doing it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Okay. And finally, you had written here love is never selfish or self absorbed. Yes. Now, th this is a very interesting thing because uh, most spirits uh, will make suggestions to us that are based around our own selfishness or, or self absorbed behavior. Mm. In other words, they will, they will sort of get us to do something before we consider what impact that has upon others or the environment and uh, and fr you know frequently it's easy to suggest such things because we already want to do them yeah and uh, we would already like to have that particular thing and you, you frequently see this when it comes to making money mm. because people want to have more money generally and so spirits make certain suggestions that are out of harmony with love of the environment or love of others but but you go ahead with it anyway because it's going to benefit you right yeah. and we many of us are basically just being selfish we haven't developed our character enough to consider everybody mm. and all we do is consider ourselves so in that regard we're sort of like spoiled children who only ever consider our own needs or wants and uh, and 
And so we're easily manipulated by spirits suggesting you should go for that. You should go for that. You should go for that. Mm. And I know many people who call that God, who call somebody influencing them to get their selfish wants. They actually feel that's God. Mm. Yeah, God really helps me. I always get what I want as mm. they go, you know. Mm. Yeah, no, if, God, if you're always <laughs> getting what you want and, uh, and you're not in a condition of at one moment with God, then I'd suggest to you that you've got some spirits around you who are just, you know, feeding you what you want. And you've got to be very careful because it's going to be a very selfish and bad outcome yeah. down the track for you, yeah. as well as for the spirit involved, obviously. Yeah, yeah, mm. absolutely. Yeah. All right. So information that comes to me as a combination of my selfish attitudes and addictions that support my selfish attitudes and addictions, yeah. obviously um, is out of harmony with love. Mm -hmm. and obviously is not coming from God. Yeah. So it's quite easy to tell uh, information. You know, often information coming from God is like the opposite of what you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> because our addictions are saying, do this, do this, but information coming from God goes, no, no, it's not a good idea. <laughs> so uh, most people... Most people who believe they're getting influenced by God always get what they want, but, they, you know, they're not realising actually that most of the time God's uh, view of love is much higher than our view. And as a result of that, many times God will be suggesting, no, it's not a good idea when we, when we think it is a good idea. Yeah, yeah. So really, to answer the question, how I can tell the difference between conscience and spirit influence, you said a lot of things in there. But basically, you're saying you can exercise some discernment and analysis of how the information is coming to you and the content of the information mm. and very rapidly begin to. If you've, if you've got some sincerity in that process, you're rapidly going to tell. Yes. And the key is the content of the information yeah. more than anything. Yeah. Um, and this yeah. is where most people fall down because yeah. they have a requirement that everything is about their benefit yeah. or seemingly to their benefit. And so the content of the information is frequently not considered because it already matches what they wanted anyway. Yeah. And, uh, and people are not considering the ethics or morality of that. Mm. So, yeah, f frequently people are, hev like everyone on earth pretty much is heavily spirit influenced in, at different times of their life. Mm. And most people on earth are heavily influenced all their life mm. because they are unable to listen to God's voice through the conscience and instead are being guided by spirits who can more easily communicate with them using the method of dropping thoughts and motivating their current emotional condition. Mm. Mm. Okay, so again, as we've said in a lot of the previous answers, it's stuff we have to do internally that is going to shore up our connection with the conscience and, and to yeah. really be discerning. And we're going to have to want to give up spirit influence. Most of us don't. Most yeah. of us feel they it, that even nasty spirits bring us some form of benefit. Mm. And we have a lot of codependence mm. with spirits. And so we don't want the we don't want to listen to God. We want to listen to spirits instead. And unfortunately, many of us have got into the habit of calling that God, which yeah. is which is a terrible thing to do because it maligns God's character and nature. But it also means that we believe that we're doing the right thing when often we're doing the wrong thing. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The difference between conscience and personal emotions. So this is a, a good thing to talk about, isn't it? Because very often, um, as we've talked about in other parts of the series, people say things like, my conscience is bothering me when they're feeling a bit bad. And um, <laughs> we've already kind of established that God doesn't give us feelings of feeling bad or wanting to make us feel bad. The conscience is all about uh, connection to our soul that tells us God's truth, isn't it? Yeah, you could say that God's telling me truth through the conscience mechanism, but at the same time, I've got emotions. Mm -hmm. which are also telling me things through mm -hmm. the soul mechanism. There's a soul, you know, all of our emotions are soul based. So, yeah. so it's a soul mechanism that allows me to feel my emotions. So I've got a soul mechanism with the connection with God and God's feelings and thoughts about matters. And then I've got still my own soul, which has its own emotions and its own feelings and thoughts about matters. Mm -hmm. So the real question then becomes, well, how do I tell the difference between those two things? They seem to be like so close to each other. Well, yeah. How do I tell the difference? And that's a valid question I yeah. feel that we need to ask. Yes. Mm. All right. So how can I tell the difference? 
Well, firstly, God's thoughts, uh, you could say, God's feelings and thoughts, are, and therefore God's truth is always in harmony with love, as we've mentioned in the spirit communication mm -hmm. issue. If, uh, if we are having feelings like anger, rage, resentment, uh, hatred, uh, shame, guilt, and fear, a lot of other yep. fear, sadness. sadness, and a lot of other things yep. that motivate our actions, mm -hmm. then then they are our feelings. They are not God's feelings. God mm -hmm. doesn't have those feelings. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so, uh, you know, if we're having those feelings, it's highly likely that those feelings don't come from God. They come yeah. when I say highly likely, it, 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 they don't. <laughs> they don't come from God. They come from us. Yeah. They come from within us. Now, whether that's a response to what God is saying mm -hmm. by the conscience or whether it's just our own condition yeah that's what we need to determine but yes. but at the end of the day they are all coming from us from yeah. within ourselves yeah mm -hmm. yeah okay so that's not to be confused with the conscience yeah and as i mentioned um just there in the little intro um god's truth received through the conscience is always just truth yes and so what a lot of people do with this is they go oh it's really bothering me that I've just felt this particular thing, you know. No, no God, God doesn't bother you through the conscience. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if, in fact, if, if God felt he was bothering you, he'd stop bothering you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he doesn't bother you through the operation of the conscience. It's yeah. not God's intention to compel us to do or act upon the truth we receive mm -hmm. from the conscience. Mm -hmm. That's not his intention. The intention is just to inform us. Mm -hmm. It's just provision of information, truthful mm -hmm. information. That's mm -hmm. all it is. Mm -hmm. Whatever response we have to that information is our response, therefore our emotion. Mm -hmm. So if we feel bothered, mm -hmm. that's our emotion. If we feel guilty, that's our emotion. If we feel happy, that's our emotion. Mm -hmm. They're all our emotions. God, God is just informing us via the mechanism of the conscience. Mm -hmm. That's his intention. Mm -hmm. Inform us as to what God feels about any matter. Yep. That's the intention of the conscience mechanism. Yes, and if we feel compelled to act mm -hmm. um, without understanding why, which many of us do when we say, oh, uh, My conscience compels me to do to this. To do this, but we can't really reason about why. So, and there's no logic. Yes. Then there's something wrong. So we have to consider that that's just our personal emotions that we're labelling conscience. Yes, and yeah. frequently they are unhealed personal emotions. Yes. You know, like sometimes people say, oh, my conscience just compelled me to not have anything more to do with that person. Mm. You know, things mm -hmm. like that. Or, mm -hmm. you know, I've just felt compelled that I couldn't engage that particular thing with that person. Yeah. You know, when most of the time these kind of compulsions come from spirits or they come from our own unhealed, yes. unloving emotional condition, yeah. addictions, in other words, yeah. that compel us. So, and particularly if we do it in a frenzy, yeah. <laughs> you know, then we're really, you know, God doesn't make you frenetic about anything. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, obviously there's obviously something else going on there where spirits or our own emotions are causing the frenzy. Yes, and my experience is that usually if I humbly want to hear the truth, I might receive some communication by the conscience. Mm -hmm. uh, Not might. <laughs> yes, I will. You will. will. That, for yeah. most people, they think might because, you know, they don't understand the mechanism or they don't, they don't um know how in tune the mechanism is or they're not personally in tune with the answers and so it's a hit and miss affair is what it sort of feels like yes and perhaps the might is more about my humbleness <laughs> <laughs> definitely you know. well, desire for truth oh. desire for yeah. your love desire to act desire yes. to listen desire for humility mm. and there's a lot of other things as we've already discussed mm. 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 um but when when i'm in that state i'm usually going to respond to the truth that I hear rather than to um, to re uh, it's all right I think we've got an example later on that I wrote personally and I'll just talk about that in that section uh, yeah because because I do feel that 
The conscience mechanism can work where we can hear it but not respond. Yes. We, we do have that choice to not respond and, and God doesn't badger us, uh, you know, and, and insist that we respond. That God's not like that. God's very gentle with us and, and God's given us a gift of free will so we don't have to respond. But, but you know, obviously there are times when we feel, like, oh, yeah, that feels good to respond to that. And, and, yeah, responding to the conscience, if it is our conscience, will always not only feel good while we're doing it, generally, mm. it usually feels good afterwards too. Um, yeah. Depending um, on what addictions are. <laughs> of <course>. That's right. <laughs> and um, perhaps I was trying to draw the contrast between acting in fear and guilt and responding to truth. They feel different. Yeah, well, we, we yeah. talk about that, the next yeah. point, really, a bit more, don't we? And then we've got an example of, or two of that as well. But um, I feel this issue that we're talking about now about the communication of truth is the issue we're on, I think, isn't it? Yeah, sorry, <laughs> I thought we were done. I was moving no, on to that next yeah. one. I apologise. So, so, yeah, yeah with, the um, with the issue of communication of truth, God's just sharing truth and you're allowed to have whatever you have as a result of it. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. And if you think about it, if, it, if you were with loving people, they'd do the same. They'd share the truth with you and you're allowed to you know, get angry if you want, be sad if you want, you're allowed to cry about it if you want, you're allowed to be happy about it if you want. They, they won't try, be trying to dictate your response. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you feel happy we've covered that one? Yes. Because I, yes. don't, I don't want to yep. move you on prematurely. Um, and this one... Um, I feel that the example is probably going to make it clearer. If, but let's discuss yeah. the point first, sir. Yep. Okay, so if we feel a strong sense of guilt or fear motivating us to action, then the conscience is not operating. Hmm. So interesting thought this, because a lot of people would assume that means the conscience is operating. Yes. Particularly when it comes to the guilt side of things. Yes. They would go, oh, I feel guilty, so that's my conscience operating. Guilt is, a, is an emotional response that is yours. So there's something going on inside of you emotionally that causes you to feel guilt. Mm -hmm. Now, it could be that God's truth was shared with you and you found that your desires and actions were in disharmony with that truth. Mm -hmm. And that's why you feel guilty, mm. right? That, that could be a source of your guilt, but it's not the conscience that's the source of your guilt. It's your own emotional response to the truth that's being received by the conscience in that example mm -hmm. that is the source of the guilt. Mm -hmm. So this, it's the contrast, if you like, between God's condition and your own that is the source of the guilt. Yes. Is it true that if we are motivated to act out of guilt, then we are motivated to act to avoid emotion? Yes. Guilt, guilt is always uh, an emotion that most people want to avoid. Guilt, shame, these kind of emotions are usually methods of control that were mm -hmm. used by our parents in our childhood. And uh, God does not use them because those methods of control are unloving. Mm -hmm. That's why God doesn't use mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. so, so the fact is that when we feel guilt, shame and other kinds of emotions like that, and we then act because to avoid those particular emotions, we are actually acting in avoidance of emotion, not in harmony with emotion mm. under those circumstances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can see that um, guilt, fear and other such emotions, when we act in those emotions, we are acting in, from an unloving motivation. And that is not the operation of God's conscience, of no. the conscience. The, God's communication via the conscience will never try to get us into a heightened state of guilt or fear. Uh, mm -hmm. in order to produce action. All God is doing is informing us of truth. Now, it is possible that God informs us of some truth and we get pretty afraid. Yes. But that is our emotional response. For example, if you decide to murder somebody and you ask God first about what's going to happen afterwards from, to your soul, mm -hmm. and you feel you will feel a whole heap of things that are going to happen to you from God uh, with your soul if you murder somebody, mm. As a response to that, you might feel very afraid about murdering somebody <laughs> internally. But your fear is your fear. It's not, it's not the conscience mechanism. God's yeah. just informed you. But your fear is your fear. Mm -hmm. And if you act in your fear, in other words, you don't murder somebody because you're afraid, well, God doesn't see that as a valid or a good motivation for not murdering somebody. Mm. Obviously, 
love would be a better motivation to not murder somebody yes. <laughs> rather than just fear. So, so you can see that, uh, you know, obviously if we're acting in fear or acting in guilt or acting in shame or acting in anger, these are all our emotions. Mm -hmm. They're not what God's trying to trigger. God's just informing us. Mm. Our emotions are our emotions. Yes. Mm. Okay. All right. And the final point there, unless you'd like to say anything more about that point, because I feel... Um, yeah. No, I think, I think that's the on, main yeah. point because it's, you know, with... This, basically, we need, need to remind our listeners that these are all ways to tell that, oh, I'm having an emotional response here. God's not trying to force me into a position here. I'm just having an emotional response to what I'm hearing. That's all. Yes. Yep. Yes. And if, if anybody comes along to our session, you know, to a Divine Truth seminar, frequently they'll notice the same kinds of emotions. They'll ask me a question. I'll talk to them about God's truth on the matter. They get all uppity or angry or upset or sad or whatever about God's truth on the matter. But that's just their emotion. Mm -hmm. It's not how I feel about the issue. Mm -hmm. It's not how God feels about the issue. It is just their emotional response to that issue. Yeah. Same goes when it comes to your interaction with God via the conscience. Yeah. It's just your emotional response to the issue. That's all. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um... Our final point was unloving emotions are usually based around the justification of selfishness or the desire to please oneself. So. Yes. So um, this is an area where a lot of people say to me things like, oh, God told me to go and do this thing and oh, it was really good for me. You know, I re it really did this and it really did that. And I go, but, but wouldn't it have harmed 25 other people? You know, didn't mm, it harm this mm. person? It oh, yes, but obviously God thought that was all okay or whatever. No, mm. I'm sorry. <laughs> God doesn't think it's okay to harm people. <laughs> like, if, if you're just telling yourself a story that you decided to go ahead with that particular thing and you wanted the justification that God told you to do it and probably a spirit told you to do it or your own feelings told you to do it and you weren't considering anything else but your own selfish motivations. Yeah. That's all you were considering. Yeah. God doesn't feed your selfishness. So if you're just interested in your own selfish motivations and, and you think that God's telling you to go and do something that just benefits you, mm -hmm. highly unlikely mm -hmm. that God's done that. It, when, when God sh shares things with us, it usually benefits everything, not yeah. just you. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. God told me to go and ride the motorbike over this pristine ground and do it up because I needed the relaxation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> God told me to dump the, all, all the oil into the sea because that was the best place for it. <laughs> yeah. So, again, it's about being discerning, isn't it, about what, what's, what are the emotions involved and... Um, sure, we're going to have emotional responses to the to the conscience, but if if most of us are not honest about yeah. us about our own motivations, yeah. yeah, and that's what we're getting at here. Yeah, a lot of the times our own motivations are quite clearly unloving, mm -hmm. but we're looking for a justification, and many people then claim that the mechanism of the conscience is the justification. So even when you feel bad, even when you feel guilty. A lot of people say, oh, that's God by the conscience. You know, a lot of religious people would suggest that. It's mm, not. Mm -hmm. God just shares truth. He doesn't try to make you feel guilty. If you feel guilty, it's your own emotional response. Yeah. 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 That's right. Yeah. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Let's now talk about an example of the difference between personal conscience and personal fear. <laughs> oh, sorry, we should probably say the conscience and personal fear. Because remember, the conscience is not, not personal. just personal. Yeah. God is sharing truth via the mechanism. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. the mechanism is personal, but the, the truth that's coming through it is God's. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 All right. So um, here we just made a note about... Um, the way we can confuse conscience. Uh, so when we um, act in guilt and fear, when there's family injuries within us that cause us to, uh, we may have been made to feel guilty or mm -hmm. afraid when we're children. Mm -hmm. um, and then we want to avoid those feelings. 
and we do things to avoid the fear or guilt we can call that acting on our conscience mm. um, obviously it's not so obviously it's it's really just acting upon our personal injuries that were created by our family living situation so as as we've said before a lot of parents use guilt and fear as a method of motivating somebody to do the right thing and in fact the, most religions have now taken up this same kind or same form of motivation this is where where the hellfire hell brimstone burning burning in hell thing came from you know with regard to punishment you do the wrong thing you're going to burn in hell forever you know this kind of concept is really just an extension of a lot of family concepts uh, which are you know if you do the wrong thing by us we're going to punish you for as long as we can to make you understand that you did the wrong thing by us <laughs> you know that's really the parental feeling that comes as a result of it and 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 a lot of the times the reaction of the family system the parents in particular are so strong that all the child feels is that its own blame it just feels like it's to blame for the parents emotions it's to blame for the way things happened in other words the child carries around a whole heap of guilt and fear about its own badness and for for many people that then translates into as an adult every time they hear a little bit of truth they are just acting in guilt and fear about trying to correct that truth trying to correct it trying to make it better and like you said there uh, that the primary motivation is to be a good boy or be a good girl um, or to be perceived to be is probably a better way of yeah. saying it a good boy or a good girl because we're not that concerned about whether we are good we're just concerned about whether everybody thinks we're good <laughs> oftentimes and these kind of things are all motivated by guilt and shame and fear based emotions that are created during our childhood experience mm. and and this is very different to the conscience see if a parent was acting the same way god was acting the parent would just sit the child down sit the child down and say this is the way what i think is right and this is what i think is wrong but it's up to you to choose whatever you want mm. and they wouldn't guilt or shame or make the child afraid to choose those particular things they would just explain why the thing is right and explain why the thing is wrong and allow the child to make the choice most parents don't do that most parents don't allow the child to make the choice because the parent wants the child to make the same choice as the parent <laughs> so so basically what the parent's trying to do instead of doing that is they're trying to say this is what's right and you have to do it is really what they're saying now god doesn't do that god says this is what's right and this is what's wrong and this is the you know the result of doing what's right and this is the result of doing what's wrong but you're allowed to choose to do whatever you like with the subsequent results whatever they are yeah and god doesn't get all angry and bitter and twisted and decide to punish you more when you do what god didn't want god knows that the breaking of the law is sufficient enough to create the pain and suffering necessary to correct us he doesn't have to then punish us forever and make us feel bad forever and to, and to remind us of that thing forever because mm -hmm. he knows the law will do the correction so so this is very very different uh, acting out of fear and guilt and acting in harmony with conscience very very different to each other mm -hmm. yeah. mm. another example of the difference between conscience and selfishness yeah so uh, this example is good because uh, most of the time i feel you know we're, we're pretty self-absorbed particularly when we're still on earth uh, we're pretty self-absorbed we're, we're still in our childhood or our infancy and as you, as most people would know most children don't really think of very many other people until they start growing up a bit <laughs> and most children are very self-absorbed they only think of themselves they only think of what they want they only do what they want they they play most of the time they don't work they don't care for themselves very much particularly initially unless we they, we teach them how to and and so they've got to learn a whole heap of things in order to become an adult most of us don't learn how to how to eventually get rid of selfishness most of us remain selfish 
most of our lives. And so we're only focused on our own desires, our own wants. What we, we call them, though, our needs is what we call it. And in fact, there's a whole group of human philosophy now that talks about basic human needs, which I find like fascinating yeah. because really it's basic human wants yeah. and basic human demands really is what it really often reverts to. And, uh, and, a, and a desire to justify these demands to the point of even harming somebody else mm -hmm. is frequently what happens. Mm. So my emotions that support my selfishness will encourage me to believe that any messages I receive are there from God, supporting my own selfishness. <laughs> and so I can sweet talk myself into this concept, <laughs> this idea that actually everything I'm doing is in harmony with God, when really everything I'm doing is in complete harmony with selfishness. And I've met some so-called gurus around the planet <laughs> who, who have this down to a T. They tell everybody around them that they're loving them and they care for them and all this kind of stuff, while at the same time, they are only motivated by their own selfish desires and nothing else. Mm. And they prove that through their actions time and time again, where people around them get terribly damaged and terribly hurt, where people around them are, you know, even physically violent or, or these people finish up raping them or harming them sexually, you know, and they just, it just goes on and on and on what these people are willing to do, mm. calling it love, mm. calling it being nice, calling it being godlike, calling it being one with God even. And it's a terrible disgrace, mm. but it's human nature, unfortunately, when I say nature, mm. it's, it's the way that we've been taught, when, when we're taught as a young child to only feed our addictions, mm. as an adult, we're going to be only concerned with feeding our addictions. Yeah. And, and, and Everything around us will show us that we're doing the wrong thing. But if we are convinced ourselves because we're unwilling to be to be ethical, which all of these people generally are very unethical, they will do and you can do many very harmful things in that place. And it's not just because they've been brought up badly. It's because by the time they're an adult, they have no desire to consider anybody else's feelings about what they do. Mm -hmm. So it's so, what is that? A, a psychopath really, isn't it? A person who does not consider anybody else's emotions or feelings mm. in what they do is a person who is just completely self-absorbed. Mm. Now, spirits love people who are self-absorbed as mm. well mm. because the spirit can connect to that person and get a lot of their feelings through the person as well. And, uh, and so frequently these people are heavily spirit influenced by very dark spirits mm. as well mm. to do the things they do. Mm. Mm. So that's not the same as conscience. <laughs> conscience is a lot purer and more loving than that. Mm. Conscience would be able to help you see, ah, oh, I'm treating this other person in a way that I would not like to be treated. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that, that's, obviously, that's obviously something to bear in mind. What I've learned is that if I, by analysing the decision, would I like to be treated that way? Uh, just that one question can, can get you out of a lot of spirit influence and get you out of a lot of selfishness. Yeah. Most people don't want to consider that one question, unfortunately. Mm. Mm. Mm.